Creation's Second Song In the beginning there was only quiet. Coldness and silence penetrated all within the void and its god, Selurel. Nothing other than the frigid quiet was known, except by those beyond Selurel's domain. Only Tarvena, the father of all, he was called Father Time, and his younger brother, Turembar, the master of fate, knew other. Before Turambar gave over his domain to his three daughters, lo, before they were sang into existence, there existed only the three brothers, Tarvenal, who fixed all things within the void, Turambar, who often coaxed the eldest to action, and Selurel, who disliked every perfect sphere of creation his brothers deposited in his void in which he froze with his frigid silence. With the eldest brother watching, Turambar pushed those first orbs of creation into motion. When those first ones collided after many millennia, which passed as if a day to the gods, they exploded into a cacophony of sounds and stirred to cosmic motion with the first blast of song. It shook the void and called the worlds into motion. Circling soul, two sisters danced around the bright jewel of the sky, spinning in silent motion. Celerel watched, ever frustrated by his brothers, until his domain quieted again. But Turambar had been so pleased with the sound that he continued to guide the sisters' destinies and he encouraged Tarvanal likewise. It was to Esfa that the father whispered, and his voice awakened her. Across the night sky, Esfa's sister, Leguin, heard them but faintly and roused from the slumber to sleepily watch nature emerge as an awakened goddess. Mother Gael, Esfa. Gael's voice soared into the expanse, drawing the attention of the other spheres of Tarvanal's creation and threatening to rouse them in similar fashion. Celurel drew close to end her proclamation, but her songs of Genesis had already begun. Tarvanal smiled upon her and desired her to sing and bear his children. The goddess's voice rumbled low as tectonic notes roared and undergirded the soprano whistle of her winds, and she birthed two gods of the elements, Eldurim and Aeluril. Her passions rose with fiery zeal, spewing lava from her core and spawning Fariel. Her song reached a crescendo with Agarurel and it trickled to a gentle babble as life's song faded to a sustained vibrato. I need not tell you what happened next of the four gods' creation of the elder races. Much has been written in the tale of creation and elsewhere. But Esfa's quiet sister, only those with oracular sight know the truth. Leguin can be seen shimmering above the horizon at dusk and dawn, but only the sages remember how she awoke to life in a harmony song, subtler than Esphus, whose choir was four strong. Celurel could not tolerate this noise, but could seek no recourse amongst his brothers, and so he fell upon Gael. Interjecting his will, he reached for her with his withered hand and shook her, disrupting nature's song with corrupting touch. Her songs turned to a shrieking dirge as his gnarled, chilled taint, and Celurel took perverse delight in those cries, more than he appreciated the silence and his abuse towards Tarvanal's beloved spawn, the bastard god known as Death. Celurel despoiled his brother's beloved nature 
and then returned to the coldness of void, to watch his own son come into being. Turambar watched from Le Guin's embrace, both desiring to help his brother's lover, but afraid Selurel might similarly ravage his precious Le Guin. Strife came to the children of nature, and the five siblings' quarrels came to bloodshed. In the third year of the first age, three things came to Esfa, the dragons, by Gael's own tears, the misbegotten one, the god, death, and the first daybringer comet. In response to his siblings who comforted their mother and threatened the younger brother, Death composed his own lyric. His song reached his father's ears and pleaded for obliteratingly certain effect. Sir Arel gladly flung an instrument of apocalypse. He cast a meteor with unerring aim. Half as large as pale, Raudian, Death, rejoiced at the twisting mass that would quickly end all of Esfa's song. With her children in danger, nature sang again, more fervently than ever. Her song pierced the cold and reached Tarvanal's ears, but Turambar was closer, watching curiously from his post with his hidden lover. The song's beauty moved him so much that he intervened before the comet could strike splintering into it the chain which passes on a loop through the cosmos, circumnavigating the heavens every twenty-three years to remind Selurel that song will always defeat the silence. It is for this reason that those who worship Gael celebrate Turambar's day at the comet's arrival. While the first meteor shower rained harmlessly upon Esfa, large pieces struck the sleepy sister and scarred her face, rousing her to wakefulness similar to her sister. Leguin screamed with surprise, but her voice was pure and pleasant, and Tarimbar blessed her. Three pieces fell from her and entered the void from bright soul. They eventually lodged upon the face of Rahu Dian, as the daughters of Turambar, who he left to watch over Esfa, to shape and guide their cousin's fate, intervening if necessary. They can be easily spotted on a full moon's night. Now apparent in his own right, Turambar gifted Mother Gael, setting a crown upon her head to remind her that she was not alone. Turambar and his family promised to keep guide nature's children to the last generation, blinding his line with hers. Upon his crown, he set a powerful diadem, Turambar's elemental relic, in which he wove his desire to prosper his sister's niece's children and the music they make when they resist Selurel's entropic desire for the void to consume all. For the grand silence, his son, death, seeks to actualize. Some say the relic was a flute that could control the elements. Others say it was a gem to reflect the glory of the mother. Still others refuse to believe it all. Deafened by callousness and death's spirit as he works further his father's will. Only the sages know the relic's true nature and purpose. It must remain hidden. After this intervention came the fall of Turambar, when Salarel created a muse to trick him into leaving behind his godhood status and become music itself. That tale of trickery is recorded in the fall of Turambar. But before his metamorphosis, Turambar gave the three singing sisters the power of fate and control over the destinies of all Esfa's children. They are the sisters of fate. There existed other songs of Turambar and of Leguin, who he loved as Tarvanal loved Esfa. 
but most were lost when the libraries of Yentosh burned during the dawn of war in 19 F.A. Only fragments exist. <laughs>